Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to my talk, uh, How to Know You're Doing Good, Measuring Performance in Cloud Native Systems. Um, so to start out, just a bit about me. Um, so I spent some of the first four years-ish of my career working in a kind of a DevOps role, site reliability engineer. I've worked a lot with container stuff. Um, but for the last year, I've been working in more sort of traditional backend engineering role at Arupa. I work mostly on Python services. Um, so just kind of full disclosure, uh, I work for Aruba. Aruba is a gold sponsor, and that's how I have this talk slot. But I'm hoping to still give a good talk for everybody. Um, I've given a few talks in other places, based in Cape Town. Um, and on the right, there are various ways you can contact me if you'd like to. Um, so a bit about Aruba and what, I, what my job is. Um, so Aruba makes all kinds of like, networking equipment. Um, uh, especially for like corporate Wi-Fi networks, um, but I'm part of the user experience insight team. We make really just this one product, which is this device that looks a bit like an access point, but is not. It actually tests um, uh, networks, um, so it will connect to wireless or wired networks and act like a user, uh, measure some things, and then send that back to us. Um, I'm actually not going to talk about this much. This is one kind of monitoring, and I'm going to talk about the monitoring that I do on my team. Um, so my team kind of fits in here, where this tiny little cloud is. Um, we deal with basically everything that these sensors send back to us. Um, so there's quite a lot of data, and that needs processing, storage. Uh, we send alerts, notifications. Um, so uh, it's quite important that all that stuff works reliably so that the product works reliably so that we are able to monitor networks well. Um, so moving on, uh, this talk, just to give an overview, it's really aimed at developers. Um, it's not uh, aimed at really like DevOps specialists. I think these are sort of intro skills. Um, and so if you're like a seasoned monitoring metrics person, a lot of this you'll probably know and I would suggest you just switch streams. But a lot of this is stuff that's just like not really taught um, to developers. Um, it's, I, but I think it's like a really important part of software engineering, but it's not really taught as part of like a computer science degree or anything like that. Um, I'm also going to try and focus on concepts over specific technologies. So I'm not going to recommend any specific tech. Um, there are a bunch of Datadog graphs in the slides. That's because that's what we use. Um, so that's what I had on hand. But I've tried to not really say anything specific to that uh, service. Right. So uh, I've got this phrase in the title for the talk, um, cloud native systems, which I slightly regret because it's kind of a buzzword. Um, but I think this does have some meaning to me. And I'm going to explain what that is. So. Some basic properties, uh, you're working with microservices to some degree, so multiple different services distributed across uh, different hosts. Um, and generally, the services can communicate and collaborate using HTTP APIs. Um, they could communicate other ways, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm just keeping it simple. And we're just talking about HTTP. Um, then I'm assuming like a cloud environment, um, if you want, to run a server, you just use an API or click in a console. Um, basically, this means we can scale out. We don't have uh, long running processes on single pieces of hardware. Um, and we kind of just have the attitude that we pay people to do stuff that we're not so good at um, and is not core to our product. Uh, and then finally, I think one of the more important messages of kind of this whole talk is the idea of DevOps. And I really believe that developers should be able to handle the operations of what they of the things that they build. Um, so we're talking about not having a separate kind of ops or sysadmin team that will do things like look at your application metrics. Um, right. And so on the right, I've kind of got a little bit of a sketch of a small part of the architecture we have for our system. Um, I've kind of stolen this from a previous talk I did. Uh, the point is a bunch of different services talking to one another and we need some kind of monitoring some kind of system so that we can better understand 
all the complexity that arises from this. Um, so I'm just going to jump right in to like basically what people think of first with monitoring and metrics. Um, and metrics are really just measurements, right? Um, and the first step uh, in collecting these measurements is we have to produce them. And so we call this instrumenting your application. So we add some special code that produces these metrics we're going to record. Um, so uh, this generally means you'll use the library specific to whatever monitoring system you happen to use. And hopefully somebody else has decided that already for you in the past. Um, we've got two examples on the right here. So the first one is Java, and that uses the Prometheus client library. Um, and we're doing some imaginary amount of work in some job, and we want to measure how long it takes to complete that. So we use this timer, and we observe the duration after running that job. And then the example below it, uh, this is Python, and we're using statsd instead. Um, in this case, we've got a batch of work, and we want to measure like how big that batch is, how big the batch we're processing at a time. So we measure that. Um, so these cases are uh, quite specific examples or uh, kind of artificial in a way. Um, in a lot of cases, you'll actually be able to not really write that much code to get metrics for your application. And oftentimes, it'll be a matter of, say, installing a certain middleware in the web framework you're using. Um, but this is just to give you an idea. Often, you will need to still measure a specific thing um, and instrument your code deliberately. Um, so I think it's kind of important to understand what these metrics are. And I think a good way to do that is to actually look at the protocols that different monitoring systems use. Um, so I've got three examples here, Prometheus, StatsD, and InfluxDB. And so all of these have like a line, a human readable line protocol, which is just like new line delimited. Um, so you can see quite a lot of similarities between them, and they're all quite easy to read. I'm going to break down what each of these things means. Um, so the nomenclature kind of varies a bit, um, but is all very similar. Uh, so uh, we've got a metric name, and then usually we've got some labels or tags, and then the actual value of the thing that we're measuring. Um, so I'm going to go into what each of these means. Um, so uh, the main three things names, tags, and values. Uh, to start with the metric name, this corresponds to, you know, what is the name of the thing you're measuring? Um, and this, I would suggest you try and keep standardized across different services, um, because then it makes it more discoverable, discoverable to find, you know, same metric across different services. Um, and generally, when you're putting a metric on a graph, you're probably only uh, referring to one or two different metric names. Um, so yeah, that's something to keep in mind. But uh, there's also the case, like we had with those code examples earlier, where you're measuring like a very specific thing to that application. And I would say in that case, it's fine to have a metric name that is quite specific. Um, yeah. And then the tags. So the tags are kind of like extra context. Uh, that give more information about this particular measurement. So in this example, we've got the HTTP method, which was post, and then the view or API that actually dealt with this request. Um, and that view is called customers. So imagine we're creating a customer here. Um, so the tags are like the dimensions that we query across. Um, so say if we wanted to measure how many post requests we did, um, that's a query we could run. We wouldn't really... Uh, run a query of like how many different HTTP methods they are. So that's kind of the difference between the value and the tags. The tags are to choose, and then the value is the actual value. Um, these are usually like a string key value pair. Um, also something to note is that there's usually like a limited cardinality. You, in most systems, you won't be able to have, uh, uh, you know, like millions of tags with millions of possible values. Um, this will generally blow up your metric system. Um, and so you can't, often can't do things like tag with the user ID if you have a million users. Um, it does depend on the metric system you use or the monitoring system you use. Um, then finally, the value, it's basically some instantaneous measurement. Um, generally, you have different types. So there's like a counter, which is kind of incrementing infinitely. So this would 
be an example of a counter. We've got 42 requests. Next time we have 43, et cetera. Um, and then there's the gauge, which is more of an instantaneous value. So uh, our job batch was we had 42 jobs this time and 12 jobs this time. And it doesn't make any sense to kind of add those up necessarily if we want to know the size of the batch. Um, and then finally a timing, which is like how long something took. Um, these values are usually some kind of 64-bit number, floating point integer, but some metric systems will support like different types beyond uh, just numbers. And some metric systems will also support uh, multiple values for each measurement. Um, but this is less common. Um, usually you just have more measurements for each value. Right, so I've kind of broken down what a metric is. Um, and I'm going to talk about what I think are kind of the three key metrics that your application should have. Um, so first of all, throughput, it's like common example of request per second. Uh, then the latency, as a common example of response time. And then availability, this is usually calculated from like an error rate. So how many requests are failing or going wrong? Um, so there are kind of a lot of different names for these things. Uh, so you may have heard of like golden signals, uh, red, rate errors duration. Um, then use is kind of like an older one that's more hardware oriented. Um, so yeah, on this slide, I've got my first kind of reference to an outside source. I'm gonna post these slides in the Slack uh, straight afterwards, um, because there are quite a lot of references and links throughout these slides. Um, but yeah, so no matter what you call these things, I think the three uh, questions that you should be asking yourself is like, how much of this thing is my service doing? How fast can it do it? And how reliably? Um, and you want to measure those. And if you think about it, you can't really have like less than all three of these, right? Like your service may do like amazing performance, but if it's not available half the time, that's useless. Um, likewise, like if your service is up all the time, but you're just so slow or you can't scale, that's also bad. Um, right, so I'm gonna go into each of these and kind of how we talk about them. Uh, so throughput, uh, this is definitely the simplest. Um, so it's generally we'll say like requests per second, um, please try and record this metric per second. It is like a pet peeve of mine when somebody says, our service does 5 million requests per day. It's kind of like somebody saying uh, in a recipe that they want 32.6 ounces of flour. Like it doesn't compute in my head. Um, just say per second so that everybody understands and has a frame of reference of what that means. Um, so uh, you'll notice on this graph, it kind of has little peaks. Um, this is quite common for throughput graphs, so uh, I think this is like a week view, and then we have uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or little peaks there, and then a lull over the weekend is quite kind of common pattern. Um, right, and then we can also kind of slice the throughput uh, metric a different way. So in the first case, this was like we have four separate replicas, um, and in this case we've got uh, each kind of API that's being called has a different color. And so this can often kind of help when you're diagnosing uh, maybe bottlenecks in the system or opportunities to re-architect. Uh, so in this case, uh, we've got kind of a service A and these are the metrics for service A. And we know that this kind of Okay. Okay, thanks. Sorry, it seems like we dropped there. Um, so I've gone back slightly from where I was. Um, so we have this throughput graph and the different colors here are different instances uh, running. So we can slice this throughput data different ways depending on what tags we've used for it. Um, so this is sliced different ways. So in this case, we're doing uh, different APIs in a different color. Um, so uh, this can be kind of useful, this view, to kind of diagnose opportunities to re-architect or to uh, uh, isolate bottlenecks. Um, so I'll give you an example of that. So this graph is, say, for service A, um, and we can see that most of what it's doing, most of the requests it's serving are this kind of yellow-beige color, um, which happen to be requests that it's basically sending through to service B. Um, so. Perhaps we could re-architect the system so that 
the load balancer in front of service A could rather uh, route the necessary traffic straight to service B, and we could skip sending this traffic through service A. And then service A could spend more time working on some of these other requests that require more from it. Um, yeah, so that's kind of a trivial example, but it can be useful. Um, then I'm going to move on to latency. Uh, latency is a bit more complicated than throughput. Um, we don't measure average or mean latency. Uh, so we generally talk about percentiles. Um, so this is like if you take all the latency measurements and you order them, then the P50 or 50th percentile would be the 150% of the way through that list. And then we can say that uh, everything, uh, we can say half the requests were uh, at least as fast as the P50 and half the requests were slower. Um, so we generally measure P50 and then some combination of P90 something. Um, so it's very important that we measure percentiles uh, because the latency is typically not um, kind of uh, normally distributed. It's not a nice bell curve. So the mean doesn't really mean much. Um, it also means you need to be careful with how you work with this data. You can't really average a P99 across different uh, instances. It kind of loses its precision then. Um, and also these measurements are often estimates because uh, calculating these numbers would require storing uh, every latency measurement ever. Um, we have to kind of use various algorithms to estimate these numbers. Um, so this graph is what we call a historical latency graph. So we've got uh, the bottom lines are kind of the P50 median, we've got P95 and P99, and we call it historical latency because it's across time. Um, and so here's kind of a, another historical latency graph, and you can see we have like this nice big dip in the latency around 12 on the 30th. So that was when we deployed an optimization, and that's good. It did a good job, brought down the P95 substantially. But if we slice the data a different way, we switch on the P99 graph, uh, we see that there are still quite a lot of, well, the top, the slowest 1% of requests are still quite slow, and we didn't do anything to improve that. Um, so yeah, there's still a win overall, but it's, you need to kind of have a complete picture of the data. Um, another way of visualizing this latency is with a, a latency distribution or histogram. Um, so here you can see what I mean when I say the latency is not normally distributed, not a nice bell curve. Um, we have kind of a lower bound, so our service is just not going to do any faster than around 18 milliseconds. Um, it's also multimodal often, so you have like different peaks. Um, so the first peak is maybe kind of a fast path through the code, and the second peak is the normal path. Um, and then there's usually also a long tail, so um, yeah, so some requests just take a long time. So this is kind of quite a typical latency distribution for an API. Um, and here's another look at that same optimization I talked about earlier. So we can see nicely that this distribution includes time both before and after um, the optimization. And we can see we made this particular API quite a lot faster, which is nice. Um, then another measurement that's quite useful I've found is if you take the throughput and the latency and multiply them, or if you, it's kind of the same thing as saying you add up all the latency and uh, this is kind of a measurement of the total time spent on a particular API. So this is a really good way of finding bottlenecks in the system um, because you want to know which APIs are both popular and slow. Um, because a really popular API uh, that isn't slow is maybe fine. And a really slow API that is just not called very often is maybe also fine and not really worth your time to fix. Um, yeah. So then finally, the third measurement, availability. This is probably even more complicated than either throughput or latency. Um, but it's generally measured in sort of a number of nines, we say. So 99% would be two nines, 99.93 nines, etc. cetera. Um, in practice, this is usually calculated by calculating error rate and then subtracting that from 100%. Um, an important thing to note is that 100% availability is basically impossible, and you actually probably shouldn't try and chase that because you will burn all the money in the world, um, and your users 
inevitably whatever they use to connect to your service won't have 100% availability. Um, yeah, so it's a bit pointless to kind of aim for that, but we can try and get as close as possible. Um, and also often people measure this availability in different ways. So sometimes they use like an external probe, like some kind of service, like, like uh, uptime robot or something. Um, that kind of has its limitations because you're not really stimulating real user behavior. Um, it's quite artificial, um, but it's better than nothing. Um, so in general, when we talk about availability, what we want is some measure of like the ratio of good service to the total demanded service. Um, so another reference here, um, there's this quite interesting paper by some Google engineers recently called Meaningful Availability. Um, and they say there are three properties you should look for in an availability metric. Should be meaningful, should actually mean something to the users. Um, should be proportional, so um, a change in the availability shouldn't be like a drastic change if the impact wasn't actually that large. So it needs to be proportional to the impact. Um, and then actionable, you want to be able to actually have some insight into why availability was low. Um, they also point out these two different ways that people generally measure. Uh, availability, so it's either time-based, we have this idea of like uptime divided by the total time. Um, this is uh, nice because it's meaningful, like the user can use your service during that uptime. That's, that's clear that it's meaningful, but on the other hand, uh, what is up and what is down and what about like partially down, what does that mean? Um, then the other case, which is a bit easier to measure but maybe less meaningful to your users is account-based. Uh, availability. We have the number of successful requests divided by the total requests. Um, so I recommend you read this paper. It's actually quite an easy read and has some interesting ideas for how to solve this problem, which I'm not really going to go into. Uh, what I will do is just mention a couple of examples of how people do this in practice. So uh, I've got two popular cloud services here. So for S3, Amazon will take, uh, you can see like a count based uh, availability metric and they'll do that over five minute windows and then what both of these both amazon and azure will do is they will average those buckets over uh, the entire month and then report that to you at the end of the month um, so this azure uh, db error rate is similar as well um, so th this one's just over an hour period also important to note both of these do an availability figure per account. So what quite often happens with availability is that um, you have some users that are much more popular and use your APIs a lot more uh, than others. So that can kind of warp the availability numbers if you don't use a per user availability number. Um, then we're talking about availability. Uh, we can kind of move on to our next topic, uh, which are these various service level uh, indicators, objectives, and agreements. So these would be quite um, well known to anybody who's like DevOps or SRE professional, but I think less well known uh, to developers. So these are three kind of similar but related things. So service level indicators are like the metrics that you decide are good signals about your level of service. So you pick some of the metrics you collect and you say like, these are the ones we're going to put into our measurement of our service level. Service level objective is the objectives you have for those indicators. Um, so this is basically taking an indicator, some number, and turning it into true or false, like are we meeting that objective or not? Um, then finally, a service level agreement is kind of, uh, well, they call it a service level objective, but with consequences. So that's kind of like the contractual stuff. Um, this could possibly involve like, lawyers and business people who decide with your customers, uh, you know, what is an acceptable service and what happens if you miss those service levels. Um, so yeah, I encourage you to kind of read more about this. There's also a link to a good YouTube video there. Um, yeah. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about dashboards. Um, so, uh, dashboards can be uh, quite useful, but I find only really in specific circumstances. So a dashboard is generally kind of a customizable web page um, that you have on your monitoring service and you set up various graphs on there. Um, 
And these are very useful for, uh, especially in debugging, uh, when something's gone wrong, you can kind of try and figure out which metric is you know, wrong, and also for checking on deployments to make sure that the metrics remain the same after a deployment. But they do have some limitations. Uh, I think the first is that they can quite easily go out of date. Like somebody has to actually maintain these dashboards, or else if your service, um, you know, if you change the name of the metric or you change the way it's recorded, so that means something different. The dashboard has to be updated accordingly. Um, also, the other thing with dashboards is that you can easily end up with a lot of them. Um, you can end up with maybe one per service, and if you have a lot of services, it's a lot of dashboards. Um, and people sometimes try and aim for this idea of like a single pane of glass, where you can fit one dashboard on your screen that will show you the state of the world, and that just gets more and more impossible with the number of services you're running. Um, it's also the kind of thing like people put it up on TVs in their offices, and I'm not really convinced that that is more than just aesthetics. Um, but yeah, so the question is, you end up with all these dashboards, who looks at them? Um, and nobody can look at all of them all the time. Um, so just be quite aware of that. I think my aim with dashboards is just to make it very easy for people to check on basic anomalies at a glance. Um, especially if somebody's working on a service that they haven't worked on before, um, then they can just kind of like service and see the measurements that are important to that service. Um, yeah, then uh, I'm going to kind of spend a little bit of time on distributed tracing, which is like a more kind of advanced uh, metrics system. So this is quite a new and upcoming technology. So the idea here is that we measure the entire user request, even as it passes between multiple services. Um, and we do this by sharing a certain amount of context between different services. We instrument our services that they send and receive this extra context, usually in headers and the request that has information about the overall trace that that request is part of. So a trace is basically, there's one trace for kind of the incoming request and then there are spans for the separate things that happen. And those spans could be sometimes on different components on the same service or sometimes on a completely different service. And so in this way, we can see and or trace the flow um, through the various services when a request comes in. Um, yeah, so this is very cool conceptually, but there are some challenges with it. So I think first of all, the most difficult challenge is instrumentation um, because you're trying to instrument all the services um, throughout the whole request that can often be quite difficult. So you have like a maybe a legacy service that's difficult to update. Um, you also have to go and deploy like so many different services to get this running potentially. Um, maybe those services run completely different web frameworks or programming languages. Um, there are various ways around this with uh, technologies like service meshes, but those come with like their own complications. Um, and then I think another big challenge is the visualization. It's just so um, this idea of the spans and traces is quite nice. I find that it's kind of a natural way of thinking about things and it's very popular. Almost every, every monitoring service there is out there will show you a picture like this. Um, but it can get very complicated very quickly. As, as soon as you have like more than a couple of services, it's quite difficult to see what's going on in these traces. Um, and for example, on the right here, we've got, I've just screen captured like a partial trace here and we can see down the bottom, there's this dark blue um, and the tracing instrumentation is tracing through every single middleware in this Django stack, which is again, conceptually kind of cool, but like that information is not particularly useful to us. Um, also distributed tracing, just you've got to instrument, instrument all the stuff, you've got to store all the traces. Generally, you have to pay quite a lot for these services, so cost is kind of a challenge at the moment. Um, there are some cases we still find this very useful. Um, so if we want to know uh, like which services are involved in a request, um, just checking on the time, um, this is a good tool, um, provided that we've instrumented enough of our services, um, especially for somebody who's new and maybe doesn't know all the different systems. 
um, or how they fit together. It's great to be able to see this. Um, also, we can kind of see where the time was divided up between the different services. If you see on the right of this screen capture, we've got like 27% of the time was spent in Postgres serving this request. So that's quite useful information sometimes. Um, then also uh, when there's an error and that kind of gets uh, you know, fed between multiple services, we can quite easily, usually, see where that error occurred amongst the different services. Um, there's a really good uh, blog post which I've linked there. Um, yeah. So, and then kind of the last um, tool I want to talk about is error reporting. I know a lot of people use that and I think use this and I think it's um, kind of a bit of a like unsung hero of operating services. It's uh, service like uh, Sentry, which is what we use, but there are various other ones. Um, so this is a, usually a tool that you, you instrument your application with it and then it will capture any exceptions that your application throws and send those off to an external service. And you'll actually often be able to see specifically the entire stack trace where that error happened. Maybe sometimes like in this example, uh, you know, what the variables were even. Um, so this is very useful and it means that it's actually kind of rare that you need to look at the logs for a service. Um, and the way our team works on this is that we often just spend some time each work each week and kind of work through a backlog of the errors that were reported in Sentry and kind of try and squash those. Um, and these services also often have some basic inter, uh, integration with like tracing and logs. Um, so Sentry has some tracing support. So if an exception in one service um, causes an exception in another, you can actually link those two exceptions together using by searching by the, uh, the trace ID, um, which is really cool. Um, then uh, kind of in conclusion, uh, this was really like an introduction to a lot of these metrics and monitoring and tools. Um, there's, there's so much more. Um, we can talk about, uh, but what we've got through is like, we understand what a metric is and we can start recording these basic metrics now. And I think it's very important that you have these metrics for all of your services everywhere. Um, you should know these things. Um, then I showed an example too of like an optimization we did that made things faster. And having these metrics is super useful because you can actually prove that the work you did was worthwhile. Um, yeah, and then um, kind of just got started on thinking about how you define availability. Um, this is like, I think it's going to be kind of a different question depending on your business and your business model. Um, then uh, talked a little bit about setting objectives and contracts for service levels. I think you can sort of start doing this whether or not you're planning to have an SLA with customers. It's kind of good if you have multiple teams that are running different microservices that uh, interact with each other to have uh, objectives and like basic agreements between each other about the level of service is I think a good thing to have. Um, yeah and then I talked a little bit about some new techniques like distributed tracing and error reporting. Um, but yeah I think I've ended a little bit early um, but that means a bit more time for questions. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I will check the chat for questions. Uh, no questions so far. Um, yeah, I will share these slides. I've also got another slide with yet more links or things to learn about. Um, yeah. Thanks everybody. I will give a minute or two for any questions. Um, yeah, I guess you can also just ask me on Slack. Um,
Cool. Thanks, everybody. Indeed.